The Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, Part 1. Hey guys, John here. This is the first in a series of videos on the Gospel of Thomas, the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. Uh, this is the one that everyone from Greg Braden and everybody's been talking about, but I wanted to give my insight on, um, it's because I think it's going to be a, an, an interesting text to deal with. And so let's just go ahead and, and just jump right in, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit of, of, of the, the text, and then we'll, I'll come back and interpret afterwards. The Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. These are the secret sayings that the living Jesus spoke and Didymus Judas Thomas recorded. And he said, Whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. Jesus said, Those who seek should not stop seeking until they find. When they find, they will be disturbed. When they are disturbed, they will marvel and will reign over all. After they have reigned, they will rest. Jesus said, If your leaders say to you, Look, the kingdom is in the sky, and then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, It is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is within you, and it is outside you. When you know yourselves, then you will be known and you will understand that you are children of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, then you will live in poverty, and you are poverty. Jesus said, The person old in days won't hesitate to ask a little child seven days old about the place of life, and that person will live. For many of the first will be last, and will become a single one. Jesus said, Know what is in front of your face, and what is hidden from you will be disclosed to all. For there is nothing hidden that will be revealed, and there is nothing buried that will not be raised. You see here in the beginning of this that, that they're first of all talking about the secret teachings again. Now this is very much a Gnostic thing. The word Gnosis itself means secret teachings. So the idea of this being a secret teaching coming from a Judaic sect is, is an interesting element in itself, and the fact that it is considered Gnostic, meaning secret teachings, it makes sense that it would start out with, these are the secret sayings. So it, it very much is a, a Gnostic in its interpretation. However, it's, it's not secret in the sense of Jesus trying to be secretive. What it is, it's, it's things that could not be spoken aloud to the Judaic sects or to the, any, any other religious structure specifically Judaism of the time, you could not speak of these things because they were uh, over, they were empowering. They were an empowering thing. So let's just dive in. First line, whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. He's basically saying you have eternal life. And, and this life itself is, is, is incorporeal. It's, it's not real. It's something that is, is, of an illusion. And so in this very first statement, whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. And what's interesting is we're at a time in our history where people are interpreting these exact sayings, and they're coming up with very unique perspectives. And the, the, the interpretation that I'm giving right now comes from my own experience in, in not only my, my life as John Davis, but my my experience in that time of John of old, too. So um, to me, this is right in alignment with the teachings of eternal life. And he says, those who seek should not stop seeking until they find. When they find, they will be disturbed. When they are disturbed, they will marvel and will reign over all. This is a great saying because he's telling you to keep looking, but in the reality of it is, if you tie this in with the what was said in my regression, the when you, when a uh, path is laid before you, yeah, you know, when you seek a path, a path will be laid before you. But until you turn the path back to yourself, you never find the doorway. It's basically saying you're out looking for the answers, and the answers are all within you. But when you you're going to be looking and looking and looking, but when you finally find it, it's going to disturb you because all the stuff on the outside is not the reality of your experience. It's not the 
in all the religion, all the dogmas, all the all the things that you feel you need to reach God are are not real, and they're they're used to manipulate and to, and to coerce and empower others. And in what he's saying here is, you're going to go out and you're going to you're going to study. In my own personal life, I've studied everything from Buddhism to Hinduism to Wicca to all the New Age teachers to, of course, Christianity, and in many of its branches and forms. You know, and I've I've studied the Gnostic text as well, and 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 Islam. Right? I've studied I've studied them. Right? Baha'i. So I have I have been seeking and I have been finding. But what I found was these universal truths within all of them that brought brought me back to the place of the oneness of God. And so, it it for the people who are hearing these words, it disturbs them. You know, in my personal life, um, I get uh, pretty nasty things said to me sometimes, but always from Christians because it disturbs them what I say. It disturbs them because it's not of their teachings. So you're seeking, you're finding, and you're just getting disturbed because the things you've learned, the things you've found, are not the real information. They're not the real teachings. The real teachings are far simpler and more present than any religion can possibly hold. So, next line. If your leaders say to you, look, the Father's kingdom is in the sky, then the birds will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish precede you. Rather, the Father's kingdom is within you and outside of you. This builds right upon what I just said a few moments ago. It's say, he's saying one religion will tell you it's in the sky. One religion will tell you it's in the sea. And what happens is it's in neither. It's, it's in you. And the experience of the outside of you is you as well. It's all one. And the, what he's saying in this, in this statement is you, the oneness of God is within and without of you. It's in other words, your thoughts, your expressions, all of this is God. And you're a part of God, and you're an expression of God. And so he's literally saying that, that the religions of the world are telling you that God is on a cloud in the sky, but in reality, God is right here in the now within you. Then he, said, then he goes on to say, When you know yourselves, then you will be known, and you will understand that you are children of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, then you will live in poverty, and you are poverty. So this, this statement's fascinating because it's, once again, building upon the one before. It's saying, when you know yourselves as one with God, and then you will be known and you will understand that you are children of the living Father. You are a part of the, you are spawned from the, the, the living God. You're part of the, the living God. In uh, Hinduism, God is the sit and we are the sitsat key, the individual sparks of consciousness within. That's what this is saying. It's literally saying that we are within God, yet still individual. And when you, and when you know yourselves, you live, he says, when you do not know yourselves, you will live in poverty. And you are poverty. So when you do not realize that you wield the power of the oneness of God, then you'll live in poverty because you feel you're lacking. You feel that, that separation, that source, and you live in that poverty. And, you, and you, your physical reality becomes that poverty because that is your belief. So he's literally talking about the manifestation process here, which is amazing if you really think about what he's saying. Let's move on. All right. Jesus said the person old in days won't hesitate to ask a little child seven days old about the place of life, and that person will live. So someone who gets older, you know, they often say that as we get older, we become more childlike because we start to strip away. You know, many of you probably know an older person who's lost all their filters, say whatever they want, right? And they start to becoming less attached to the physical things in life. And it, it's interesting because in that, in that regard, what they're doing is they're becoming more childlike. And in the Bible, it says, you must become as a child to enter the kingdom of heaven, and what he's saying here is that the old person will go to the child and they'll hear the wisdom from the child because the child has, has yet to get the beliefs, the dogmas, and have someone tell him that God is in the sky or God is in the sea. That some, he doesn't have those dogmas, those understandings. My son at six years old said that God is inside of everything and everyone and we control the God part inside of us. 
It's the most beautiful way a child can say, we are one with God, and we get to wield the power of God within us. Beautiful, beautiful sta- statement. Um, for, for many of the first will be last and will become a single one. Many of the first will be last and will become a single one. This one's actually saying the people who, who came first, who, who, who don't let go of all those religions, they'll be, they'll be left alone in the world. They, they will be last here in the physical, and they'll be the single one left. But they're not going back to the oneness of God. They're coming to this place of many of the, the, the older people, many of the people who've been here the whole time won't let go of their belief and will be here alone and left because they're stuck in this single place. Jesus said, know what is in front of your face and what is hidden from you will be disclosed to you. Know what is in front of your face. In other words, be aware of the things that are being created around you. Come to understand the realization that all these things around us are part of a creative process that we ourselves are involved in. And in being involved in that creative process, we have the ability to then move forward and uh, know that we, that all the information of the universe is right there, and all the creative elements of the universe are right there, and all those things that are hidden from us, because we now know of our oneness of God and our power to wield that power, we now have all things that were hidden from us before in our lack. So it's a beautiful, beautiful statement. And then it, it, this, this piece ends with, there is... N- Nothing hidden that will not be revealed, and there's nothing buried that will not be raised. So he's saying you'll get all your knowledge, you'll get all your understanding, and all of the things that in this physical world will, will, will cast away, will be raised in, and, and, and leave this and become part of the oneness. The, um, when, you, when you look at the, the elements of um, the ones who will be last and left alone, they're going to be experienced the physical right up to that experience. And then when they cross over, they'll probably, they, this may mean that they're coming back to stay in the physical, right? Um, but nothing in the hidden will not be revealed. You'll, you'll know everything is what that says. And there's nothing buried that will not be raised. In other words, everything that we've killed and died and buried in the physical is, is still in existence and around. But the people who are still here we'll still see it as something that's been buried. So this is a very interesting interesting take. Let's move into the next piece. His disciples asked him and said to him, Do you want us to fast? How should we pray? Should we give to charity? What diet should we observe? Jesus said, Don't lie and don't do what you hate because all things are disclosed before heaven. After all, There is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, and there is nothing covered up that will remain undisclosed. Jesus said, Lucky is the lion that the human will eat, so that the lion becomes human, and the fowl is the human that the lion will eat, and the lion will still become human. And he said, The person is like a wise fisherman who casts his net into the sea and drew it up from the sea full of little fish. Among them, the wise fisherman discovered a fine, large fish. He threw all the little fish back into the sea and easily chose the large fish. Anyone here with two good ears had better listen. Jesus said, Look, the sower went out, took a handful of seeds and scattered them. Some fell on the road and the birds came and gathered them. Others fell on rock and they did not take root in the soil and didn't produce heads of grain. Others fell on thorns and they choked the seeds and the worms ate them. Others fell on good soil, and it produced a good crop. It yielded 60 per measure and 120 per measure. So here here we are in the first part of this this piece. His disciples are saying, you know, what religion should we follow? Right after he told them, if you're looking at the ones in the sky, then He's, what, he's, he's saying, they're saying, what religion should you follow? Should we fast? Should we pray? Should we give to charity? What diet should we observe? He's, they're asking for religious principles for him to, to dictate down to them, to give them a dogma to follow. Jesus said, don't lie and don't do what you hate. 
because all things are disclosed before heaven. In other words, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're believing, whatever you're creating into your experience, whatever you're casting upon another is, is going out into this creation. And because all things are disclosed before heaven, all things, and disclosed is an interesting word. Disclosed means revealed to. Means when you say something, it's being shown to you. It's going to be revealed to you. It's going to be disclosed to you. And the world will see it around you. So you lie, you're going to be found out to be a liar. You hate, you're going to find, find out, found out to be a hater. And, and it's going to be shown into the world and it's going to be expressed. And, and your personal world will become more of a struggle because of your lies and your hate. Um, and then he says, there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. He literally is telling you, no matter what you do, it's going to be shown to the world. And there is nothing covered up that will remain undisclosed. Everyone's going to know. Everyone's going to know. Jesus said, lucky is the lion that the human will eat so that the lion becomes human. And the fowl is the human that the lion will eat. And the lion still will become human. He's basically saying you're one with everything. The lion's eating the human, but the human's part of the diet and the, and the human's eating the lion. It's, it's all part, it's all one. The lion and the human become as one. The fowl becomes as one. Every, everything you're experiencing is one. And it's a matter of realizing everything's, everything's, you know, it's a cycle. We're all part of this world together. Um, and then he says, the person is like a wise fisherman who casts his net into the sea and drew up the f- sea full of little fish. Among them, the wise fisherman discovered a fine large fish and he threw a little fish back. So he's saying <clears throat> lots of ideas and thoughts and, and dogmas and experiences are going to come to you. And it's a matter of choosing the ones that are for you or the ones that are that are that will nourish you the most. They're the ones that, that will do you the most good. And those other ones you cast back into the sea so they can they can ripen, they can grow, they can become a big fine fish that, that you know, stripped away all the all the things that don't work and all the all and grow into something that is more nourishing. And so you 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 he's basically saying here, use your discernment. Choose the ones that are good for you, choose the ones that are best for you, choose the ones that will nourish you, throw the other ones back. It's literally what he's saying here. You know, as I said in a recent video on my other channel, I said that the Buddha said <laughs> Believe no one, even me, unless it rings through your common sense and reason. And it's the same thing here. He's literally saying to you, choose the good fish, throw the little ones back so they can potentially become good fish. So, and, it, and then he, he ends this with saying, um, he throw all the little fish back and he usually chose large fish. Anyone here with two good ears had better listen. In other words, don't only think, oh, it's just fish. Think I'm choosing the parts that work for me. I'm choosing the parts that are good for me, and, and listen because this is the way you find your way through the life. And then this next part, he talks about sowing seeds. Now this is this made it into the Bible itself. The sower of seeds went out, took a handful of seeds, and scattered them. Right? Some fell on the road. Now I love the I love the terminology here. Some fell on the road. It wasn't. It weren't weren't intentional. Right? They just fell on the road. They fell someplace where they could not take root. He's putting out seeds of, of truth. And some people are like the road. They're never going to hear it. Right? He says, and then this is, um, didn't take root in the soil and didn't produce heads of grain. Others fell in thorns. They fell amongst, amongst people who were fighting and arguing and struggling against them. And eventually they were devoured by worms. And were choked out by the by the the thorny plant material by the by the opposing thoughts. The people who didn't have enough strength of, of faith to to hold on to their belief and were fell into the belief of the of the others, the ones who would scorn them or uh, prick them with their thorns. And so, and once eventually. The worms of that faith came and took them, right? Others fell on good soil and produced a good crop. In other words, he taking the the ones who will hear it, the ones the, the sentence before about let them those have ears to hear, right? He says 
Others fell upon good soil. It fell upon people who were, who were open to hearing. And it grew, and, and that became bigger than anything else could possibly come, become. It actually gave you more seeds that you could scatter than you could possibly scatter in a lifetime. But it's a matter of, of realizing that not everyone is going to, going to let their seed grow, going to let that truth that you carry within you grow. Your job is just to scatter seeds. And however it is taken, it's up, up to the, the seed itself to, to, or the soil or the, the combination of the two coming together. You know, you're, you're not going to save everybody. And some of the things you cast out will never be picked up or grown. So it's like I say all the time, don't believe me. You know, find your own, own faith, right? But I'm still casting the seeds of my truth out there. Some people will pick them up and some people won't. And if they don't take them up, I, that's, that's, I completely respect that. It's up to them. So that to me is, is a really interesting aspect of, of, the, of the Gnostic text so far. So let's, let's go to the next one, shall we? Jesus said, I have cast fire upon the world, and look, I am guarding it until it blazes. Jesus said, the heaven will pass away, and the one above it will pass away. The dead are not alive, and the living will not die. During the days when you ate what is dead, you made it come alive. When you are in the light, what will you do? On the day when you were one, you became two. But when you became two, what will you do? The disciples said to Jesus, We know that you're going to leave us. Who will be our leader? Jesus said to them, No matter where you are, you are to go to James the Just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. Jesus said to the disciples, Compare me to something and tell me what I am like. Simon Peter said to him, You are like a just messenger. Matthew said, You are like a wise philosopher. Thomas said to him, Teacher, my mouth is utterly unable to say what you are like. Jesus said, I am not your teacher. Because you have drunk, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring that I have tended. And he took him and withdrew and spoke three sayings to him. When Thomas came back to his friends, they asked him, What did Jesus say to you? Thomas said to them, If I tell you one of these sayings he spoke to me, you will pick up rocks and stone me, and fire will come from the rocks and devour you. So Jesus says, I, I have cast fire upon the world, and look, I'm guarding it until it blazes. And what he's saying here is that, that I have brought a truth that is against Rome, that it's against all religions, it's the empowerment of you, the oneness with, of you. And, I'm, and I'm, I brought this fire that's going to spread across the world and not be pleasant for many because it's, it's, it is a truth about your own divinity. It's about your own truth, your own light within you. And as it spreads across the world, I'm going to stay here until I, I can't stay here any longer. And then it's going to be up to you who I'm sharing it with to, sp- to spread it. But I'm guarding it until it blazes. The, the people who get it and understand it, they are the blaze. They are the things that are spreading it throughout the world. And so he's casting fire upon the world. He's saying this truth will spread the world, will spread across the world. And it has. It's just taken a long time, but it definitely has. And then he says this heaven will pass away and the one above it will pass away. So in other words, he's not saying this place that we're in will pass away. He says it's going to become one. You know, it, They're both going to pass away and become the one. And, and we're going to start to understand that oneness of God, that that. This heaven will pass away, and the one above it will pass away. It'll meld into one expression. And heaven, heaven is a very Christian term, but but it's it's more of a you know heaven being the the feeling and the, and the expression of God and universe consciousness. Yada yada. God is also a very rich religious term, but I still use it because of my mom. <laughs> but um, but the idea of this is is that. Going back to the source, which is what heaven will be. Heaven will be a feeling, right? And when we get back to that expression of that oneness and these, these various religious heavens all come into the oneness, what's going to happen is it, it's going, the, the religions will fall away, the structures of dogma will fall away, and we're all going to become as one. 
and live as one and, and in equality and, and in unity and and understanding that 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 person across from you is is though they were Jewish or Muslim or Christian or, or Wiccan or Baha'i or atheist or agnostic, they're part of you. And there's going to become an, under, an understanding of that is what he's saying. And I have cast this fire upon the world so that people will start to become empowered. And that to me is, is, is a beautiful statement that he's saying here. The dead are not alive and the living will not die. The dead are not alive and the living will not die. The dead are not alive. The physical world is not alive. The living will not die. The physical world are not are their vehicles, their expressions, their illusions. The dead are not alive. And the living will not die. The people who are aware of their consciousness, aware of that connection with the oneness of God, under, understand that life is eternal. And so this is an expression to him saying that you are not of this world. You are you are this world, and God is this world, and we're all one. It says, during the days when you ate what is dead, you made it come alive. So in other words, you took it into your, into your physical body, yes, but it was the emotions of feeling and eating and expressing that were part of the feeling and eating and expressing, the feeling and, and expressing of joy, of laughter, of fun, the things that you ate, you enjoyed the flavors of, those feelings were the feeling of God, or the feeling of the expressions of God. But the, it wasn't the, the food that did it. It was the, the feeling, it was the expression, it was the, it was the literal conversation you were having with God through the joy of the process, right? When you are in the light, what will you do? So now you're, you're out of the physical world, and now you're, you're in a place where there's no need for these things of the physical world. On the day when you, when you were one, you became two. You suddenly realize that you and God are one. So there's the consciousness of God and there's the consciousness of you. And so now you're there. Technically, you're two, but you're also one. There's no delineation between you. But when you became two, when you become two, what will you do? Will you come to the place where you understand that you you wield the power of God? You wield the power of of the source of all around you. What will you do with that power? What will you do with that expression of self that is bigger, greater, grander than anything you've ever experienced in life? That's what this is saying. It's literally saying when you become one with God and you know it's you and God as one, then you suddenly are becoming this, this two, this creator consciousness. And what are you going to do with that? What are you, how are you going to take that and take it into something bigger, something greater? What are you going to do with it to create a better world? The disciples said to Jesus, we know that you're going to leave us. Who will be our leader? Now, I have mentioned this in other videos before. This is a very uh, controversial topic because he says, no matter where you are, you are to go to James the Just. James the Just was his brother James. His brother James stayed in, in Jerusalem or in Israel. It was not necessarily Israel, but um, and he stayed in 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 Jerusalem as the representation of that faith, I believe. He was the one who stayed behind for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. So he's saying he's the one. He's, he's in his mind. He is, he is creating this. He is taking over. He's going to show the way. So the reason this is controversial is because by the time 325 and Constantine came around, they decided it had to be Peter who was in charge of the church. Now, why would, the, why would Rome choose Peter? Well, when Jeshua died, he sent all the disciples to different parts of the world. He sent Peter to Rome. Peter went to Rome. So Peter became the apostle of Rome. And when you go to the Vatican, St. Peter's Church, his bones are supposedly at that church, right? So for Rome to become the, the seat of Christianity, which really makes no sense if you think about it, because that's not where Jeshua is from. But for Rome to be the, the seat of Christianity, they had to have the first pope be the disciple who came to Rome. And so in this text right here, he's saying that James is the one who follows me. 
But Rome says, Peter, thou art the rock upon which I shall build my church, right? That's a Roman construct to make, make Peter the one that everyone has to follow. But right here it says, go, no matter where you are, you are to go to James the Just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. In other words, go to him because he is the one who is, who is he, his whole essence of life is to do this. And so this literally says that the, the basis of Catholicism is based upon a lie of that Peter was supposed to be the one that they were supposed to go to. Then Jesus says, compare me to something and tell me what I am like. And Peter says, Simon Peter says, you're like a just messenger. Matthew says, you're like a wise philosopher. Thomas said, my teacher, my mouth is utterly unable to say what you were like. He has no words. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't there's no words to create it. Right now, I have often said in my my videos, that words are imperfect. When you cross over and you have that experience, the purity of love is is indescribable. You can say pure love, you can say unconditional love. It doesn't touch the feeling of it. It does not touch the feeling of it. It is it is something bigger, something greater, something grander. And um, Thomas is saying, I, I can't. There's no word where I, can, I think more of you than a philosopher. I think more of you than a messenger. I th there's no words that can describe what you are. This is, this is how much reverence he's showing to Jesus. Jesus said, I am not your teacher because you have drunk. You have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring that I have tended. In other words, you're, you're getting in your ego. You're getting into this... Um, Physical, oh my gosh, I am doing this, I am doing that. Now, nowadays, you see this all over the place. You see religious people who are judging and self-righteous because their religion is the way it's supposed to be, right? And nobody else can be right, right? That, unfortunately, has a lot to do with if the Christian faith because of the Nicene Council and what Rome did. But, but you still have others in the New Age who are, self-righteous and you know well I my I know this because I believe that and and they start to get into their their own way of believing they're not open to hearing something different something greater right so they become intoxicated with information and then the intoxication itself removes the ability for you to discern because now you've you've limited yourself with this new dogmatic belief that you've chosen and that in itself is huge because it stops you from growing. Then Jesus took, took Thomas off to the side and withdrew and spoke three sayings to him. And when Thomas came back, he said, what did he say to you? He says, if I tell you one of the sayings he spoke to me, you will pick up rocks and stone me, and fire will come from the rocks and devour you. In other words, he's saying, he told me something that is so against everything you believe but it's more powerful than anything you believe. And the, the mere action and belief of that dogmatic belief you have of having to stone me or knock me down or prove that you're right will prove that you are not following the one truth, truth or the truth of, of God, right? The, the stones and the rocks are part of the belief that will devour you. You will go down pathways of anger and frustration and hurt and suffering because the very concept of judging another is against the truth of God. And that's what, that's what this is really about, is, is judge not lest ye shall be judged. And that's huge. That's, that's a huge statement. Jesus said to them, If you fast, you will bring sin upon yourselves. And if you pray, you will be condemned. And if you give to charity, you will harm your spirits. When you go into any region and walk about in the countryside, when people take you in, eat what they serve you and heal the sick among them. After all, what goes into your mouth will not defile you. Rather, it's what comes out of your mouth that will defile you. Jesus said, when you see one who is not born of a woman, fall on your faces and worship. That one is your father. 
Jesus said, Perhaps people think I have come to cast peace upon the world. They do not know that I have come to cast conflicts upon the earth, fire, sword, war. There will be five in a house. There will be three against two and two against three, father against son, son against father, and they will stand alone. Jesus said, I will give you what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no hand has touched, and was not arisen in the human heart. The disciples said to him, Tell us how our end will come. Have you found the beginning then that you are looking for the end? You see the end will be where the beginning is. Congratulations to the ones who stands at the beginning that one will know the end and will not taste death. Jesus said congratulations to the one who came into being before he came into being. If you have become my disciples, and pay attention to these sayings, these stones will serve you. For there are five trees in paradise for you. They do not change, summer or winter, and their leaves do not fall. Whoever knows them will not taste death. <laughs> this, this part of the book makes me laugh because I did a 40-day fast just recently. <laughs> Jesus said to them, If you fast, you will bring sin upon yourselves. If you pray, you will be condemned. If you give to charity, you will harm your spirits. Um, one of the things that's in the in the Sermon on the Mount that was very much a a topic that continued over and over again was the concept of vanity. And many of these these things here is if you fast, you bring sin upon yourselves. If you're fasting and and doing it for religious observance. You're not really being with the oneness of God. You're being with the religious observance of the dogmatic rituals. I personally fast because I feel better after I fast because I eat junk food a lot of the, a lot of the year, and I go eat pizza, and I go have all these things, and every so often I just like to give my body a rest. I don't do it for religious observance. What he's saying here, he says, don't follow the dogmatic rituals of religious, religious observance. Now, do the things that are right. Because the next line he says, when you go into any region and walk about the countryside, when people take you in, eat what they serve you and heal the sick among them. So, so in other words, be in the moment and, and do the right thing in the moment. You know, that is the way to the kingdom that comes to you after death is to be in the right moment, to be, be here in the moment, in the I am moment, expressing love, not worrying about rituals or, or dogmatic things because those are just of the constructs of man trying to wrap a... a a structure around God. But in reality, none of them are reality. You and God are one in the, in the present moment. Your past is done. Your future is not set. The only moment you ever experience is your present moment. And so right here, right now, you know, eat what's generously offered to you. Help those who desperately need help. Be kind, be considerate, be in the moment and dynamically loving. If you can be in the moment dynamically loving, you are, you are literally delivering the teachings of Jeshua. You're literally putting that moment back into the world as an expression of love. And what was his final commandment? Love one another. Just go out in the world and be very present and be very loving and be in the now doing it. Don't worry about your fasting for a day of, of uh, glory when you go to the pearly gates. None of that matters because that's all come from the constructs of man. It's about being here in the now and loving. I leave you one commandment, love one another. Love one another. That's all this is really talking about. It doesn't say fasting is, is a horrible thing, he says, but if you're doing it for religious observance, absolutely, it makes no sense because you're not really putting it into action. And then he says, after all, what goes in your mouth will not defile you. Rather, what comes out of your mouth will defile you. I love this statement for a big one, big reason. You find zealots of all forms. You know, the, the biggest religious zealots that, that come after me are Christians. The, bi <laughs> the biggest dietary zealots that come after me are vegetarians. They get mad at me because I said, Jesus... Jeshua ate lamb and fish. 
They get mad at me when I tell them that he's not a vegetarian. They've created this story around themselves that he's a vegetarian, and he wasn't. It says it right here. What goes in your mouth will not defile you. Rather, it's what comes out of your mouth that will defile you. And earlier in this exact text, he talks about eating a lion. And that lion becomes part of the human. Right? So it, it, it's not what's, what's, what you're consuming that's defiling you. It's your beliefs, your thoughts, your words, your deeds, the things that are coming out of you. Do you love, love people? Do you, do you put that expression into the world? Or do you curse them? Do you judge them? Judge not, lest ye shall be judged. Every day I get at least one judgmental comment from a Christian who doesn't like what I say. I'm okay with that. You know, I put out, put out YouTube shorts that say things like, you're empowered to make a more beautiful world. Somebody always dislikes it. One or two, sometimes three. People will dislike it. I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that hundreds li like it. <laughs> you know, they click the thumb up, right? But the, th the thing is, there's always going to be those people who, who will t take their story as the way it's got to be. Some people don't like my painting because they say that can't be him because he wouldn't look like that. They don't have a memory of him, but they have this picture or this story in their head. The religions are the stories. The dogmas are the stories. They're the paths that we go down. But until you turn the path back to yourself, you never find the doorway. And yourself is only found in the present moment. And the actions and the thoughts and the words and the deeds of your present moment are the expression that you will see in your next moment. And so when you realize that you are, what's coming out of your mouth is, is being shown back to you, then you come to realize that what's coming out of your mouth is the abundance of the world or the lack thereof. And so this statement to me is beautiful. And for those who want to judge me from the fact that I eat meat or, the, or that I'm no longer a Christian or call myself a Christian, I, I'm okay with that. I respect your beliefs. But if you're judging me for it, that's what's coming out of your mouth. The hate and the anger and the, and the things that you're spewing are making your life very unpleasant. And if you're taking the time to click a dislike on somebody saying that you're empowered to make a world better, I really feel sorry for you. Because you're the one who is out there having to say, I dislike this. And that feeling with inside you and those words that you're putting out are not loving. They're not loving one another. They're judging and spewing hate. And so you want to make sure that you're not doing that. You want to make sure you're being very present and loving one another. And that's, that's what he's talking about here. Don't worry about what you're reading. Worry about what you're saying, doing, and believing. When you see one who was not born of a woman fall on your faces in worship, for that one is the Father, right? Now, there's a lot of people who are going to say this is saying that, that, that you know, that's, that's you know, absolutely true. It's a big mystical, esoteric experience. I think it's more sarcastic. Because Jesus was born of Mary. We know that according to the Bible, right? So he was born of a woman. So he's literally saying that if you see something better than this, worship it, follow it. If you see something better, if you see something bigger, and you see something that, that is not of woman, then there you go. But everything comes from the woman. If you, and if you go back to the Apocrypha of John, everything in the physical reality came through the feminine aspect, the barbello. And so everything comes from a woman. Everything comes from the, the womb of a woman. And so he's literally saying, if you find one that's not born of a woman, fall on your faces and worship that one. Do you find it interesting that, that he's saying this right after he just went down and said, you know, don't fast and don't pray and all these things? He's, just, he's saying the same thing. He's saying, if you find something that, that is standing in front of you that is big and, and you can prove it, Great, follow it. But I, I, I really think it's like you know, he's giving them a task to say it's impossible to find because it's not there. It's almost sarcasm in a way. Um, Jesus said, perhaps think, yeah, perhaps people think that I have come to cast peace upon the world. They do not know I have come to cast conflicts upon the earth. 
fire, war, sword, war. Think about this for a second. The deadliest religion in the world is Christianity. And I'm going to say that again. The deadliest religion in the world is Christianity. And people say, no, it's not. And Christians will tell you it's Islam and so on and so forth. No, 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 no. Christianity has killed more people for the sake of Christianity than any other religion on the planet. The Crusades were Christians invading Jerusalem. The Inquisition was the, was the Catholics uh, ki- killing anybody who was a heretic against the Catholic faith. The Native Americans were killed off and imprisoned on reservations by Christians leaving Europe. South America, Central America, the Mayans, the Incans were not only <laughs> killed out of existence in many cases, but were robbed blind of their wealth by Christians, by Catholics. The Spanish, right? The, the, the Christians have done more damage to this world than any other religion on earth. Any other religion on earth. And when you look at the, the perspective of that, it hasn't stopped. George Bush Jr. told the Saudi prince that God told him to invade Iraq. He wasn't talking about a Muslim God. He wasn't talking about, you know, any other God kind of God. He was talking about a Christian God because he's a devout Christian. And right now you're looking at what's going on in the politics of the United States. It's the Christians that are causing all the, the turmoil right now. It's the Christians who are saying the woman doesn't have control over her body or that if you love someone of the same sex that you shouldn't be allowed to marry them. It's the Christians who are doing all that. It is the most detrimental, divisive, angry religion in the world. And it's not what Jeshua taught. Jeshua was not a Christian, would not be a Christian. And I want you to think about what Gandhi said. And then I want you to think about something for the Quran as well. Gandhi said, I love your Jesus. I don't like your Christians. And the Quran says, it is against the Islamic law to deify Muhammad as the Christians have deified Isa, the son of Mary. He says what they called him in, in the Quran. So, the deification of, of Jeshua and, and the fact that no one else is, is right after the Nicene Council. Everyone else is wrong. Everyone else is going to hell and are infidels if they don't believe Jesus is the Savior. That is absolutely antithetical to everything he taught. But he's saying here, I'm coming here to show you your divinity, to show you your, that you are empowered and everything is going to go to go to go to crap, you know. Everybody's going to fight, right? Including the people who become Christians, because they're not teaching what he said either, and they're all going to just start fighting, and they're going to do it in his name, and that in itself is 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 a horrible thing because people are manipulating the teachings to match what they want, not for truth, but for power. And that, to me, is, is what he's talking about here. For there will be five in a house. There will be three against two and two against three. Father against son against father. For there will be five in a house. There will be three against two and two against three. Father against son and son against father. And they will stand alone. He's literally saying that, that people in their own house will not agree because... They have different perspectives on things. I, in my household, I have a brother who doesn't who talks to me at Christmas, says hello, how you doing? Shakes my hand, doesn't say anything else, doesn't like talk to me. Why? Because I am not a Catholic. I have a sister in Florida who doesn't who's not not Catholic, but because of my political leaning, she doesn't like to talk to me either, and that's okay, right? People will go down into their own little zealotous lanes. I don't even know if zealotous is a word, but I'm going to use it as one. <laughs> they are in little zealotous lanes of this is the truth. This is the only thing that's true, and you're all wrong. And to me, it comes down to the idea that if you're doing loving things, you are doing the truth. If you're doing hateful things or you're angry all the time, you're not living in the truth because you're not loving yourself as, as an equal part of God as well. And so that is really what it comes down to. 
is the idea that you yourself are, are living in a loving way. And when you see, you know, of course, when you see something that's happening that's unloving in the world, you should call it out because that's the loving thing to do. But when you see the ones who are doing it strictly for money or strictly for uh, knocking another person down, that's not love. And that's how you need to express it into the world is there, there will be these, these conflicts, but you need to hold on to your truth and your own discernment. He then said, I will give you what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no hands have touched, and has not arisen in the human heart. He says, I'm going to give you this power, this truth within you. You haven't seen it in the world because nobody's, nobody's had this truth yet. No one's heard it in the world because no one's said it out loud like I'm saying it now. He says, what, what are you saying? He says, he says, it'll come to you, and then finally, it will arise in your heart when you come to understand it. Because up until now, it has not arisen in the human heart. It has not shown this, this oneness, this compassion, this love for all living things, right? Now, people are going to say, well, all living things, what about killing that lion, right? The physical world is a construct. And even in the Bible, it says all things on earth are there for man, right? And so you, you can't be, you know, a lot of people talk about the salad bar of spirituality, you know, and you, you can't believe this, but you have to believe that, you know, and it's like, so you're, you're picking and choosing your parts of the salad that you like. But in reality, it, it comes down to the physical being an illusion anyway. And the other side or the, the consciousness, and we, we, and we know it's an illusion because we know that everything we're looking at is an energy in, is energy in motion because that's what atoms are. And the building you're in and the air that's around you and your eyes are all made of the same stuff. So you're in an illusion. So anything in the physical you should just release, start to release attachment to. Start getting rid of the things that don't matter and strip yourself down to just being core loving. Right? I have an amazing video studio in my house. Why do I have it? Because they are, they are the tools that allow me to make videos. And for me, I am passionate about videos. I'm passionate about putting these, 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 this information out there. Am I a filmmaker? No, I have no passion for that. I think it would be fun to do, but I don't think I have the inclination to do it. I'm not passionate about it. I am passionate about my truth and I put my truth out on videos. And so why do I have all the video stuff? Because it helps me put that message out of the world. It's my way of delivering, right? And my attached to this equipment, I could easily go out and do the same thing on my cell phone, right? But I like bringing something that's, that's unique and fun. It gives me enough joy to say, okay, I can play with this. I can do with that. I can try new things, right? So it's not about the physical stuff, right? It's, it's more about the delivery of the method or the me message, the tr my truth, right? Not asking you to take it, but it's, you know, we, I'm not attached to these things. These things can go away. I wish you could see what was happening in my house right now. I have rooms in this house that are completely empty because I'm stripping things away. I'm purging things away, changing my life to come down to a more simple life because I'm, I'm, I wanna, I'm, moving back to the beach at some point and I am excited about that prospect and I'm excited about going there with nothing except for the barest essentials to do what I do and when I and I'm, I've been sending poxes to my brothers said, this is stuff you would like to have and, this, and I'm dropping stuff off at Goodwill and the homeless shelters and you know delivering things that, that will do good to others right why because I'm purging away because I'm not attached and the more the less attachment you can have to all the things and come back to this place of just being in that love space, then you'll know that, 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 that it is something you've never heard or seen or even your hand has touched, and that love will arise in your heart. The disciples then say, you know, how will our end come? And he, Joshua says something really beautiful here. He says, have you found the beginning then that, that you are looking for the end? You see, the end will be where the beginning is. Congratulations to the one who stands at the beginning, and that one will know the end, will not taste death. <laughs> the Bible, he says, I am the Alpha, the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. Right? He understands that time is not linear, that we are 
the, the creation. The past is just a collection of present moment memories, as I just said. The future is coming to us. We are the beginning and the end. The result is in our now. And by, by understanding that there's nothing fated or destined ahead of us, that we are creating in the now, the beginning and the end of everything. And when you start to realize that and come to the space of realizing that when you're at the beginning, you're already at the end. When you pray, believe, you shall receive and you shall. Believe it's already in, you, in the end. You're already at the beginning. Right? You're beginning it and you're ending it at the same time. That oneness of God, that coming to that space of realizing that you are already at the, at the completion. You are already in, in, the, in the end of all things. You're already at the beginning of all things. And you're already in the process of all things. You are the creator of all. You are the Alpha, the Omega. That's what he's saying here. And it comes down to you realizing since time is not linear, then now is the only time you have. It's the I am moment, not the I will be or I was. It's the here and the now. And then he says, congratulations to the one who came into being before coming into being. Understanding that you're more than this physical body. Understanding that this physical experience is, is as, as I've said in other videos, it's like scuba diving. We come down into this physical being, this physical experience to experience. But every, every six, you know, 16 hours, we go back to the other side, another level of consciousness to experience the oneness of God again. And that oneness of God that we experience on the other side is truthfully, joyfully, the expression of the source. And you know that, that you're part of that oneness of God. And the more you st of that dogma and that ritual and that ceremony that you can strip away, you will come back to a space of understanding and you'll become closer to that oneness of God. Your veil will become thinner. You'll become to realize that you are already one with everything. And that expression is beautiful. And then you can express that into the physical and you see that in return. I, I cannot tell you how many times a day I get told by people how much they appreciate what I do, the, the words that I'm bringing out. I'm, everything I'm doing is coming from my heart and my soul. I am just freely speaking. I'm not trying to sugarcoat or I'm telling you exactly what I believe every day. And people feel that compassion. They feel that love because it's my love coming out. It's my love to the world coming out to say, you have the abilities that a Jeshua did, that Buddha did, that Krishna did, that Muhammad did. You are divine, and in that divinity, you are one with God, and you are two with God, God and you as one. And in all of this, you are the expression of God in the physical. And the more you re recognize that you and God are one, and the more you start expressing God in the physical, the more the world changes. The second coming is not them coming to us, it's us going to them. It's a matter of us stepping into this space and realizing that we get to express our truth and our love and experience a world rising up into that love and going up to that next space, the divinity of us all. And let me move on to this next piece. He says, if you become my disciples and pay attention to my sayings, these stones will serve you. Stones are the pillars of the foundations. The stones are the foundations of the pillars that hold up your life, your expression, your life. So he's literally saying, these truths, these sayings are the foundation of your experience. And if you can live into this loving expression of oneness with God, you are creating a foundation that will, that will rise into the grand structure of the oneness of God. That's, that's what he's saying right there. there are, for there are five trees in paradise for you. They do not change the summer or winter, and their leaves do not fall. Whoever knows them will not taste death. I'm not sure what the symbolism of five is in this, but I will say this. When you realize that you're part of the oneness of God and all things are possible, then and change is inevitable. But he's saying they do not change because change is part of the oneness of God, which means there is really... No change because it's all possible. 
and summer, winter, leaves do not fall, whoever knows them will not taste death because they will understand of their eternal nature, their eternal life, their eternal God, and their oneness with that God and that, and that consciousness. And they come to know that space because of these foundation stones that are building the structure of the oneness of God that is based in love. And that's what he's saying so far. And uh, this is going to be the end of uh, part one of uh, the, the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. It's a beautiful gospel. And we've got a lot more. We're only up, coming up to uh, the 20th passage, and there's 120 of them. So there's going to be multiples of this video. I'm going to try to make them in, down into smaller, like half-hour videos instead of full-hour videos so that they're easy, more easily digestible. And I think that you're going to... Um, I hope you're getting something out of these Gnostic texts. I like sharing them because so many people have followed what the various versions of the Bible are saying, but they're not say, seeing all the other texts that were written that were not that never made it into the Bible. And a lot of times they didn't make it into the Bible because, just like this one's saying so far, it doesn't match the deification of Jeshua's story, which was pushed by... Judaic sects that wanted him to be the Messiah, and by Romans who wanted to control Christianity. So um, look for part two next week, and I will talk to you soon. See ya. Bye. Thank you so much for watching. The Level Up Spirit channel is solely funded by your generous donations and purchases of private readings and merchandise. Please go to johnofnew.com or use the donation link below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and comment.